all. Welcome to the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, the largest institution in the United States devoted to the arts, sciences, and artists of movie making. The Academy Museum of Motion Pictures acknowledges the Tongva people as the traditional caretakers of the water and land on which we program, curate, educate, convene, and discuss. We honor and respect Tongva ancestors and the Tongva community today, which continue to nurture this land and water through traditional practice, activism, art, and education. We also acknowledge their continued work to safeguard cultural resources. My name is Amy Homa, and I am the Chief Audience Officer at the museum. I want to thank you all. Oh, thanks, y'all. It's so friendly in here. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you for joining us in our 10-man theater for Breaking the Oscar Ceiling, presented as part of Oscar's season at the Academy Museum. Nominee program support is provided by Clarendell and Domain Clarence Dillon, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures official wine, as well as Delta Airlines. Our first Breaking the Oscar Ceiling virtual program launched in 2021, before the museum even opened. We were able to welcome and give space to four groundbreaking Oscar winners, Sophia Loren, Marley Matlin, Buffy St. Marie, and Whoopi Goldberg, all in discussion with our Academy Museum president and director, Jacqueline Stewart. This conversation not only celebrated these amazing women and their historic Oscar wins, but they also discussed their personal journeys and challenges in the entertainment industry. The Academy Museum strives to be a place where inclusive stories are told, that not only honor, uplift, and celebrate, but also share truths and facts about hurt and harm. Breaking the Oscar Ceiling is an important program and concept that helps us do exactly that. We recognize that this is deeply sensitive and complex work, but the more we collaborate together across communities and show allyship with folks like you in this room today, with support from film artists and community leaders, the more we can meet our aspirations of being a safe place for all voices, identities, and differences to be heard and respected. So I look forward to building community with all of you allies in the room tonight as we continue to embark down paths of inclusive storytelling about the nuanced and complex histories of film. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our amazing ASL interpreters who will be assisting today. Their names are Richard Loya and Felix Villarreal. Round of applause for them. Before we begin our program, I ask you to please silence, darken, and stow your mobile devices. And now let's get started. Let's welcome our moderator for the evening, Kia Kiadian, partner and co-head of the Media Rights Department at Agency UTA. Thank you, Kia. And now our nominees. Nominated for Achievement in Music, Written for Motion Pictures, Original Score, Laura Cartman for American Fiction. Nominated for Best Documentary Short Film, S. Leo Chang for Island in Between. <laughs> Nominated for Best Documentary Short Film, John Hoffman for The Barber of Little Rock. Thank you. Nominated for Achievement in Costume Design, Jacqueline West for Killers of the Flower Moon. and nominated for Achievement in Sound, Eric Adal for The Creator. Thank you so much. Welcome everybody, and thank you for, for coming to our program. Um, I wanna start off by saying happy birthday to Laura Cartman. <laughs> for being here on your birthday, and congratulations to all of the nominees and, and um, uh, I know it's going to be a busy week for all of you, so uh, enjoy. Um, uh, Breaking the Oscar Ceiling is a series that focuses on historic wins, milestones, firsts, and progress for different communities, with tonight's celebrating the 96th nominees of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and um, uh, I want to give a shout out to the affinity group that Laura is the co-chair of, uh, which is... Uh, I think we started the affinity groups maybe four years ago or three years ago. Um, if we did, we were in the closet about it. <laughs> Isn't that a good one? Um, That's the kind of birthday humor that you're going to get here. <laughs> but um, but please, uh, you know, sign up for that uh, affinity group if you are a member. 
Um, and um, it's a great org uh, it's a great group within the academy. Um, and I've been to a couple of the events and uh, really appreciate the work that uh, the chairs are putting into the organization. Um, so why are these still important to note, these historic nominations, wins? Um, uh, I'd love to hear a little bit from each of you on, you know, what what you feel is is important about uh, noting these these moments. You want me to go? Yeah. We'll start this way and then we'll go the other way soon. Well, I mean, I don't know how to make a concise answer to that. Uh, first of all, within my branch, music branch, um, I'm the, the, the categories have kind of shifted, but, um, but really in terms of original score, there have been six women nominated. I'm the sixth and three women have won. So um, if I were to win, I would be the first American woman to ever win an Oscar in film scoring. So I think that's noteworthy. But on, on a sort of a different note, um, I think one of the things that has really stuck with me this whole time is how extraordinary it is to be living the life that I'm living. You know, to be living, to creating music for a living, which is insane to start out with. I mean, just to be able to be a professional composer and then to be married and have a child, which is not anything that I ever foresaw in my life. So something we've been talking about is that, you know, in many, many ways, um, I feel like I'm living, you know, my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents, their wildest dreams in some ways. Um, and it's, it's a, it's very, um, touching and meaningful to me, um, the, the, in, the entirety of what this nomination means. Thank you. Um, we, uh, documentary branchers are very, very proud that we are the most diverse, um, both in terms of gender. Um, I, I don't know about sexuality because I don't. Not sure there's a survey of that, but also we have a lot of international members. And I think it's really important to still acknowledge this because Americans are not the only audience. You know, there are plenty of places in the world where to see somebody who's out and who, who is very proud of who they are is really, really important uh, to have, to have these role models. So um, I do hope that we can continue to acknowledge these whether historic or not, but, but, you know, just to set good examples. Thank you. Well, I, I think that the awareness and the, this, the existence of affinity groups is just a tremendous step forward, a tremendous um, sense of progress. It's, it still is notable that it, it took a long time um, for, for there to be the, um, the comfort, the commitment. Um, and I think that we, if we're living here or if we're living, I live in New York, you know, there's a comfort that we have in, in being out and there's um, in daily life, but also professionally. Um, but the journey is long and there's just so much more um, that has to be done. And the uh, vigilance to hold on to what we have. Um, I've actually never, um, it's, it's been years since I have felt that there is some sense of jeopardy returning into my life. Um, and I also live in the countryside and um, I, I sometimes wonder whether I have a false sense of security in, in that life. Um, but the sense of to return to the you know a more positive note, the sense of um, community that uh, I feel um, in in this space and in the academy is tremendous, um, and um, I'm just very proud to be able to be you know a, a such a out creative person um, and to have it feel for the most part like a non-issue. Well, 
I'm from Berkeley, and I can't believe it is still an issue. I can't believe we're still talking about it. I mean, talent is talent, no matter what your, uh, you know, where you are in your life or who you are in your life. And it, it just, in this day and age, should not be an issue. And I'm so glad that it's, everybody's talking about it so openly now. Totally agreed. And all of you are so eloquent. I feel a little pressure now following up <laughs> with these wonderful thoughts. Um, I guess, you know, for me, the art that we do, cinema, uh, at its very core, is a very empathetic experience. You know, what we're trying to do is tell a story where we're putting the audience into the shoes of other people. And, and in the world right now, it feels like there's this, you know, ever-present fear of the other, whatever it is. And, and I think cinema is a, a wonderful form of kind of destroying that idea that there even is an other. We, we're all human beings, and, and cinema has been groundbreaking through history and presenting the other, and now you have these movements and changes of, of thought and acceptance, and, and ultimately the ideal is that we are all humans and we can brace each other for who we are and not be afraid of expressing who we are. I think expression is necessary to evolution and, and connection, and to me that's what cinema does. Absolutely. I think um, you know, just some of the strands that, that I'm hearing that really resonate with me is how cinema can you know, bring an audience in and and really kind of invite you in as as almost a participant in the stories that that you're seeing, um, and then also, you know, bring it out to the world as you were talking about Leo, and really kind of you know um, uh, opening up these conversations in places where they may not exist. Um, and um, and I also think the history is something that for me is actually really fascinating, and and being in a museum where that history of these milestones are celebrated as something I just thought it was noteworthy that, um, you know, Coleman Domingo, who's nominated for Rustin, is the first gay Afro-Latino to be nominated for Best Actor, and he's only the second openly gay man to be nominated for playing a gay character. Um, and um, and also want to acknowledge Jodie Foster, who's nominated this year for NIAD. Um, obviously, she's, you know, a multi multiple nominee and, and, and a winner. And, and, um, you know, it's good to acknowledge all, all, all the other nominees that are, that are in our community and, and how they can, um, you know, represent our community, um, on, on, on this Oscar stage. Um, and I do want to get to the work because it is really the work that, um, has gotten you all here and, and you all have incredible, uh, histories and, and I want to kind of get to that. Um, uh, and let's just go out of order. Um, and, um, you know, why don't we start with, with Jacqueline and then we'll go in on any order that, that you want. What's the question? Um, I want to talk about the work and I want to talk about kind of how you started in your field and maybe, maybe a little bit about, um, a little bit of your history and in, in, in the films, the incredible films that you've been involved with. Seven hours. <laughs> um, no, I, how, how, maybe maybe the start. Like, how did you actually get your start? I think I I got my I went to school. Uh, I went to Berkeley to become a doctor, and uh, it was a period of time when everyone was reading Henry Miller, Ani Nin, James Joyce. Uh, I didn't want to read science books, and <laughs> I immediately switched my my major to art history and comparative literature. And uh, when I finally finished school, I, uh, someone said that I uh, had great style. My mother was a fashion designer, a big one, and said I should uh, open a store. So I did. And it happened to be right next door to Chez Panisse in Berkeley, which was a film salon. 
Tom Luddy was there every night. Marty was there. Philip Kaufman, uh, Truffaut, uh, Kaka Diegas, uh, Kurosawa, everybody you could think of was in and out of that restaurant on a daily basis. And because Alice, who ran the restaurant, was my very best friend and my date for the Oscars on Sunday, uh, I was there and I opened a store next door. Alice found me my storefront and I started selling clothes in Berkeley, manufacturing uh, all over. You know, I had a department in Barney's and I sold all over the world. And one day Philip Kaufman walked in and said, you should be in the film business. Do you want to design my next movie? And that's what happened. That. <laughs> Incredible. Um, a quick follow-up question. How did you find out about your nomination? Uh, this one? This one, yes. <laughs> oh, golly. I, I don't know. Sometimes I get a call like from my agent at four in the morning or five in the morning or, <laughs> you know, from a producer. This year, I... I don't remember. I think uh, my daughter called me from France. She lives in France, and she heard about it earlier than I did. <laughs> so you were asleep. <laughs> yeah, I was asleep. Um, Eric, how about you? How did you hear about your nomination? And then it would be great to hear how you got your start. Um, well, I heard about my nomination. I woke up that morning, that Tuesday, and, uh, you know, normally your phone lights up you know, the morning of the nomination, and this year it didn't. I went, okay, well, it's just one of those days. That's fine. And, like, an hour later, I realized my phone was still in do not disturb mode. Oh. And <laughs> so I turned that off, and I was like, oh, no way. So it was even better than waking up to a bunch of messages in a, in a fun way. Um, and was there a second part? To yeah, the second part of the question is talk about how you got your start. So I guess similar to Jacqueline, um, I, I was going to go into pre-med. I started at Stanford and, and, uh, did he really, I mean, it was my next door. I grew up in San Francisco and Bay area and my mom had worked there with Jane Goodall and it was seemed like the natural thing to do. And a couple weeks in, I just was not sleeping. I wasn't eating. I, and I kind of realized, okay, my body is telling me something. I realized I'd shut this door to filmmaking. Uh, they had a small program there, but um, nothing substantial. So I, I called USC back again and said, hey, do I still have my scholarship? And they said yes. And instantly I was sleeping great, eating great. And like my, my heart was telling me what, what I wanted. And I continued to double major. I did the full pre-med units. And, but then uh, ultimately uh, went into filmmaking after that. Fun fact, um, they worked together on a Terrence Malick film. So three, three of them. Three together. John? Um, how did you get your start? And how did you hear about your nomination? Well, how I heard was I was in the um, parking lot of a strip mall in Connecticut while my older brother was having a colonoscopy. <laughs> that beats all of our stories. That is the truth. Um, and continuing the theme, I was a biochemistry major. Oh my God. Wow. So, I've, go figure. And the last month I was in uh, college for an anthropology course, I made a a documentary. Um, so that's how I said, you know, the past four years have been so boring and this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. So, um, but I, I had an interesting experience um, during COVID um, where I uh, was commissioned by Disney to make um, a documentary about Dr. Fauci. Um, and so I spent two years and in most intense periods of, of the uh, pandemic making that film. And it was just a fascinating experience, very personal experience for me because um, I started my career making HIV um, education films. I started a nonprofit called AIDS Films um, in 1985 um, in New York. Um, I was working as a producer on a feature documentary and the editor and the 
assistant editor were lovers and the assistant editor died of AIDS while we were making this film. And so at his funeral, you know, the, the editor said, you know, just do something. Don't, it's not about flowers, you know, just do something. And I was a kid and it's just this idea to be a filmmaker. And I thought, well, this is what I should do. I should make, you know, do what I can to save lives by making films. So I started this nonprofit and with two other people and, you know, very quickly we raised money from the Ford Foundation and had a big benefit with Alvin Ailey and we were able to make um, the first nationally broadcast HIV prevention film um, called AIDS Changing the Rules for PBS. And, was, and Ron Reagan Jr. was the host when his father was president at the time. And um, Ruben Blades put a condom on a banana and it was the first time a condom was shown on outside of a package on national television. And a quick aside, because I have to tell the story. Um, at um, the um, press tour, PBS put out a summary of what the film was about. Um, and so there were press summaries saying that Ruben Blades puts a condom on a banana. The film had not been screened yet. And I'm at the office and I get a letter in the mail, which was a, an injunction from the National Banana Growers Association. <laughs> of all <laughs> industries. Saying, saying the first line that bananas penetrate more homes in America than anything else. <laughs> and so Johnny Carson read the whole letter on the air. NPR read the letter, and so that's how I started my career. Oh, wow. Leo? I'm, I'm not quite sure how Thank to follow God that. We told you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Okay. Well, uh, banana growers of, of America. All right. Got it. Um, uh, well, I, I was also a scientist. <laughs> I was an electrical engineer um, because uh, as an as a immigrant child, that's what you're supposed to do. I worked at Apple yeah, for two years, but I was just such a cinephile. I was watching movies. I was volunteering at film festivals. I was interning for filmmakers. And one of the filmmakers I interned for in San Francisco, uh, she basically says, here's a letter of recommendation. I went to USC. The deadline is next month, and you're going to apply. I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to get in. I have zero fine arts background. So, um, but I got in. So I think somebody was trying to tell me something. So, and how did you find out about your nomination? Um, my partner and I had planned this vacation in Lisbon, and I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to make a big deal out of this because it's the middle of the afternoon there uh, instead of five. 30 a.m. Otherwise, I would be sleeping. There's no way in hell I'm getting up at 5 o'clock for anything, which makes me a very, very bad filmmaker, <laughs> by the way. Um, so uh, we're like, well, let's go to a flea market and walk around because we're just blasé and, you know, like, I'm totally cool. But of course, you know, like, I, I'm kind of like looking at my, my What are you watch. shopping for? <laughs> um, we ended up buying this monkey. So um, he actually took a video of me finding out that I was nominated and I basically had my mouth was wide open and then I had to cover my mouth. So we actually found this monkey ashtray that's brass with the monkey's mouth wide open. Mm. So that was my nomination present. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I never wanted to be a doctor. I am a doctor of music, though. That's the best way I can relate. Um, <clears throat> no, I um, I grew up here, and my father was a cardiologist, and and um, so there's another relation. My mother was an artist, though, and she um, she was a painter and a sculptor, and she did some clothing design as as well. So I grew up with uh, you know with a love of of fashion and visual things. I loved movies. Um, but I was always going to be a composer. I started music, uh, writing music when I was seven years old. <clears throat> I never, ever thought I was going to do anything else. But what I did think is that I was going to go to New York City and become a New York intellectual. That was my plan. 
So I went to New York and I studied at Juilliard um, and I, uh, <clears throat> I, I worked with the most esoteric um, professor there whose name was Milton Babbitt. And Milton called me one day and said, I have an incredible opportunity for you. And I thought, great, he found me a teaching job because that's how, you know, those things happened at that point. And uh, I said, what is it? He said, well, there's this Sundance Institute. I said, I don't want to write movie music. You know, I grew up here. It was like the furthest thing from my mind. But I went and uh, it was the first iteration of the Sundance Labs. And uh, I just thought it was the best thing I'd ever seen. I mean, this, there was a, like a practicality to the music making that I loved, um, a daily practice of it that I really loved as opposed to concert music, uh, which at that point for me was very, you know, every note was incredibly important. And here it was like, just do something. And I loved that. I loved the the fluency and the fluidity of that. So I, I moved back out here. I gave myself a year. Um, and, uh, and then I started working, um, first in television movies, which at that point were, I mean, are there, yes, probably many of you have never even seen a television movie, knew what they were, but in the olden days, the nineties, um, <laughs> they used to have them every weekend. So it was tremendous, tremendous work. And I think because they were all female skewed, right. They were like, woman in trouble, you know, like, like, uh, I can't even remember the names, but like, you know, broken promises or, you know, a child on the edge or, I mean, they were just <laughs> awful, but what a great way to learn how to score films because you had to get to the point right away. You know, you had to really learn about melody. You had to really learn about, um, synthesizing your ideas quickly. So that's how it all started. Now, I love all the like, oh, I didn't know I was going to, you know, think about my Oscar possibility that day. No, 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 no. That was not me. That was not me. In our branch, um, we have a short list, which we can talk about, was actually something that I helped make happen um, when I was a governor because I felt that it would be more, more inclusive, that we would have 15 nominees uh, as opposed to, uh, not 15 nominees, but 15 people on a short list. And then once those 15 were out, I felt we would see more women and other underrepresented groups on those lists. And then the studios would step in and start to promote that. So um, so we had had a short list and I'd made it on the short list. Um, and so there was, you know, an okay chance. There was a good Not chance. A chance. And so we woke up at about four that morning. We took our two dogs, one of them called Big Girl and the other called Fauci, <laughs> out for walks, which sounds like it's a nothing thing, but with these dogs, it was a very, it's always a big deal to take them out for walks. We came back in, and we sat down on the couch in our living room, and our son was still sleeping in the back. And the door um, flew open to the upstairs of the house, and... I invited my parents to come in and sit with us on the couch. They're, neither are on this exact astral plane at this time. And um, we waited, you know. And um, when I saw Sterling Brown's nomination come in for our film, which was the first nomination out, and that's interesting to talk about too. You know, he's a straight guy playing a gay man. Um, I thought, oh, okay, we're doing okay. Because a lot of the way these things go... I don't know. How, how, I mean, how would you even describe it? They're, they're almost like waves, right? If the film kind of starts to get in a wave or in a circle or have some uh, have some talk about it or, or if the studios help. You know, it's been it. resonating. Yeah, it's been you resonating. You know, audiences are resonating with it and, and, and the membership is resonating yes. by the audiences. Yes. So when I saw that we had that nomination for Sterling, who was considered to be kind of an outlier from the all the pundits, I thought, oh, my God, oh, my God. And thank God American Fiction, it was first because my name came out first. Um Really, I pretty much wept um, uncontrollably for a really good long time. And um, and then Nora and I went up and woke up Benny, who probably had thought that there was a terrible crime that had occurred <laughs> in the house. And then finally, um, we had had a do-or-die breakfast at Nate and Al's scheduled for that morning. So it was going to be like, if we got it, we were going. And if we didn't get it, we were going. And when I was trying to manifest this thing, because I really wanted it, 
Um, I thought about standing up in Nate Nails and telling everybody in the whole place that I'd gotten an Oscar nomination, and I did that. So. <laughs> and it was good. Wonderful. Um, um, growing up, for me, as a gay man, a gay a young boy, uh, the films that you know, as an immigrant, like as, as, as someone who was, you know, coming up at a time when there was so much fear and, you know, being in the closet at that time was kind of the only choice I had in, in my culture. Films like My Beautiful Laundrette and Philadelphia um, really kind of um, kind of connected to me in such a deep way. And the work and I, I'm I'm also an agent, so I I'm, I'm probably some of the people that like like I probably call my clients, and I'm the first person who's calling and texting them to tell them they're nominated. So these moments where, um, you know, you, you know, you feel someone breaking through, or you feel something that's connected to your identity breaking through, are really meaningful. Um, and I'd love to talk a little bit about how um, your identity connects to your work in some way or how some of the underrepresented um, communities that all of your work really shines a light on connects back to your identity. Um, uh, and I'd love to hear, maybe let's start with uh, Leo this time. Um, just when you mentioned, you know, my beautiful lingerie, for me, that movie was The Wedding Banquet. Like, I, I don't think I can talk about that film without getting choked up even till this day so um um so i i feel like uh, if you look at my body of work and and it's funny you know as documentarians you just get drawn to specific subject matters i don't necessarily kind of analyze why i'm interested in in certain things but when i look back i realize that all my work has been about people on the margins or people sort of you know on the borders and and you know treading in the in between spaces and I think that's because, you know, as a young gay man growing up in Taiwan or as a, a as an immigrant, you know, living in the U.S., I constantly feel like I'm looking for uh, a place to belong to. Right. And I'm drawn to other people who have similar struggles. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I mean, I'm assuming that's the same for all of us. I mean, you can see a lot of me in my work, even though they're about people halfway around the world. Um, I, I am at a place where I'm actually starting to uh, look more inward and making more personal films. And uh, Island Between, which is a short doc that I'm nominated for, is, I would say, half personal. My story is in it, but it's also about this place um, that's on the border between Taiwan and China. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> well, I'm... I'm too old for the films you're mentioning to be films that were formative um, for me, you know, as it, you know, in my youth. But um, I came out when I moved to New York after college, but I can say that the film that had a powerful effect on me, but it, it, it was disturbing because um, the way the scene plays, but it it's the wrestling scene in Women in Love. Um, uh, and it's it was to see this incredibly homoerotic scene in that film and as you know a man who hadn't started his gay life um, it it just was it just was very confusing scene to to see and because there really were no other uh, I had not been exposed in in mainstream films um, prior to that um, but you know for me in terms of my the work that I do I mean I, I mentioned the, Fauci and to circle back to that because it it was um, my return um, to that era of the 80s because to make that film which um, had it was the idea of doing a film about um, you know, a, a man who it was whose character was really forged in the AIDS epidemic and challenged in the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and so to go back in the archive, because I, I had to watch, you know, probably a thousand hours of material from the 80s, and to go back there 
was so unbelievably difficult. And to see in just the the raw footage that was, you know, uh, still available to the archivists to get and to be on the streets of New York uh, in this raw footage and to see faces that I remember seeing just just being a kid, you know, then, and to be have them come back in this way was unbelievably um, difficult um, and, and, and caught me by surprise. Um, and because they're faces I would never have thought again, thought about again, and they're gone. Um, so um, you know, making, doing AIDS films was um, in my late 20s. I then um, didn't feel like I had done enough for uh, AIDS and prevention, so I stepped away from my film career for two years to run New York Hospital's HIV clinic. Um, and um, after two years, I felt that I had helped get that launched and running, and I stepped, went back to my film career, but didn't do anything that was focused on the gay and lesbian community. I went on to do many other things, but it was it was this this first experience of the power of film to tackle a really complex issue and to understand the power of film as an emotional medium, to understand that, um, you know, if you really are, I, I learned at an early age that you have the potential to change hearts and minds and you can't change policy, you can't change law, you can't change you know, the, the, the culture, unless you change hearts and minds. And so that was a lesson very early in my life. Um, and then it, it, I was able to bring that to the big topics that I've been fortunate to challenge, you know, to take on in my career, which are addiction and obesity. Um, and with my most recent film, The Racial Wealth Gap. But it's, it's, I've been very fortunate that um, my career has been where I'm asked to really take on some very complex issues um, and find a way in so that um, you can help start important conversations. Yes. Well, I've been really fortunate in my career that I've gotten to do three movies, big movies, uh, about uh, Native Americans, and uh, my husband is one fourth Blackfeet, like Lily Gladstone, and I've always had because I think I'm from Berkeley, and I went to Wounded Knee, and I have a house in South Dakota in Deadwood, right by the Sioux Reserve. That I have had uh, Phil Kaufman, the director of the Right Stuff, who brought me into the business that I have Native American romantic dementia, and I do. And when the first movie I did was The New World with Terrence Malick, and it became an obsession with me to show uh, a group of indigenous people really how they were. And I just dug so deep to do that. And then Inuritu asked me to do The Revenant, and I got to do Five Tribes. But when Marty Scorsese called me and asked me if I would do Killers of the Flower Moon, it was like a dream come true, because I had never... I was a, historian all through school. I loved history. And we never learned about the Osage. Why not? You know, America has swept how we've treated Native Americans under the rug for, you know, 150 more, maybe 200 years. And it's a travesty to me. And I, um, I decided to really portray people as honestly and as truly as I possibly could. Carl Jung said that the American psyche would not recover for 2,000 years from how we treated Native Americans. So it's been a raison d'etre and raison d'etre for me to show them really how they were and to help Marty tell this story that should have been told years ago. We should know about it in school, and we never did because we started murdering the Osage for their oil wealth. Um, I felt so lucky to get to work on that and to help tell that story and that the Osage Nation was so happy with how it ended up and how they were portrayed was a gift of a lifetime.
Um, well, so I'm also a first generation American. Um, English was my second language and I always felt kind of other, like different growing up. Um, I'd use the wrong words, mispronounced for certain things when I started having to speak English in kindergarten and so on, and never felt like I really fit in. And as I started to enjoy movies, you know, yeah, I'd enjoy the Lucasfilm stuff, but I'd also enjoy Dirty Dancing when I saw that in middle school. <laughs> and I was like, not all the not all the other guys enjoy that. Or, or David Bowie and Labyrinth. I was like, who's this guy? This guy's awesome. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, and I, and I found just, I was attracted to the other, you know, different unique voices, not the, the same standard sort of thing that you're supposed to, by societal standards, embrace. And, and I feel like I'm in my work, I, I try to, you know, on, on the new world, Terry's movie, you know, just the research into Algonquin language, which there's only one or two native speakers left on planet Earth because of how they were the predominant tribe in North America and were wiped out. And that's such a realization to me, how, how a society can view other humans as animals and, and do such atrocities um, and just the fact that we could only find one expert based in Canada who could coach us through that language and how to use it in the, in the movie. Um, and by extension, I think we also even look at beyond humankind, at animals in a similar way, as an, the other. Like, somehow we're not animals. We're separate from them and don't treat them with respect also. So... You know, I've done a number of historic dramas where accuracy is really important, but I've also done kind of high concept movies where like Godzilla, for example, and I, and I never want to portray them as just a monster. I always want them to be empathetic on some level because life is complex. It's not as simple as good or evil, or, you know, so if you can show some sort of behavior in these kind of movies um, too, which you know, these are sort of the pulp movies that mass audiences experience, but create, a, create empathy even with something that would be considered a, a danger or an enemy. Um, I think life is more complex than that, and I think we can do better as artists in not falling into those tropes. Well, yeah, it's a it's kind of a, a difficult question to answer. I think there is maybe implicit in the question, is there a queer aperture? Is there an aperture through which we look at our work that is based in our identity? Um, and I've thought a lot about this. Um, it's odd as a composer because, um, as, as you said, uh, my job is to be empathetic. That's what I do. I have to create subtext. I have to understand what's going on with a character. And then I need to add all the other information that my colleagues, you know, have begun, but needs to be finished. The same thing with sound. You know, you, there's, by the time it gets to post-production, our job is to figure out what's missing. I think at that point, uh, there's there's reality, and I'm sure you deal in realistic sounds, but there's also surreality, where you're creating backgrounds and things that, that augment what is being seen or perceived. So I do think that those of us who's lived our lives on the outside, and in a certain extent, and some of us more than others, and some of us can pass, whatever that means, um... I think that there is an aperture that is significant, and I think it comes from a place of empathy and identification. Um, I want to say that when it comes to sort of generating my own work, as opposed to being brought on to a project, um, I've just completed, and it's going to be premiered, um, 
a an opera called Balls, which is yes, you may laugh. It's based on the uh, it's the tennis match between Billie Jean King and Bobby Ricks, and um, and one of the things that I really um, enjoyed about writing it is I wrote this love song between Marilyn, who was Billy's lover, and her. And I don't think I had ever heard that in an opera other than, you know, pants roles where a woman is actually playing a man, which, by the way, is like super queer. And that's a whole nother discussion. Um, and also my wife and I have optioned um, the rights to a, a movie called Dance, Girl, Dance. And Dance, Girl, Dance was a movie made by Dorothy Arzner. Who knows who Dorothy Arzner was? Oh, look at you. That's pretty good. Okay. Most people don't. And she was a butch lesbian who worked as a director. So she was a woman working as a director and living as an out queer person during the golden age of Hollywood. And she made a genre film, but with such a strong uh, feminist and queer aperture that we thought it would be fun to tackle it and see what we could do with it musically and and um, and also bringing her story to life. So I think in generative work and work that I want to do in my my sort of spare time, I look for projects that have a queer eye and, and embrace them and want to want to put my energies into that. Great. Hopefully you'll be back with that one. Yes, well, it's a long ways off. Um, another film that um, some of us have been talking about this year um, that is nominated in the animation category is Nimona, um, which I don't know if people have seen, but I uh, definitely want to celebrate that film that, you know, is, is one of the first, I think, animated films to feature a non-binary uh, lead character. Um, and, you know, as much as there's been so much progress um, in our community, there, you know, we, we realize when we read the news how much more there is to go. Um, a lot of us are still feeling the recent loss of Next Benedict, a uh, 16-year-old non-binary student of the Choctaw Nation who passed away after an attack at their high school. Um, and I'd love to know if you have any advice for the young people out there who are finding their identity in these times where, you know, as uh, as we know, there are challenges to our community that, that, that are happening and, and, and a lot of concerns. Laura? I knew it. Because <laughs> we talked about this backstage. Um, well, I think one of the incredible things that that happened with their death is I read about it um, and then I looked at the day, I, I, I immediately went into the internet to see, I mean, I saw it on social media, uh, but not even Lambda or H, HRS, any of those, uh, those things. It was like just a thing that somebody had posted. And I said, what the F is this? And so I started searching around and I had discovered um, that they died on February 7th, and this death had just been made public two weeks later. And then I said, where is the New York Times? Where is the Washington Post? And I posted that. And a lot of people were asking the same questions. And then uh, it became something that the gay, you know, the queer organizations picked up and started amplifying. And then the Washington Post and the New York Times and um, more traditional media outlets came on um, and started reporting this. Uh, so is there a solution? No. But is there power in social media? This is where where social media is, is so incredible and incredibly powerful. Um, we had a... Um, a thing, an action that we did. There was a professor at Juilliard who was um, uh, had been hurting women for a long time, and uh, finally people were willing to speak about it, and um, we couldn't get anybody to write about it. And a small news organization, a classical music paper, wrote a little article about it, and then it started s spreading around the music community, and uh, and then the reporting was reported on by the New York Times and Washington Post. Eventually, it led to an investigation, his departure, and now the hiring of, of two women, including a black woman, to teach at Juilliard, which is a very big deal for an institution like that. So my advice would be, my God, speak up when you can and when you feel safe to, because all of us have access to channels now. Now, sometimes those channels can be very hurtful and dangerous. But I think for social justice, they can be very useful. 
And so we need to speak up. This is an unforgivable and unthinkable event. This is a, a child who's three years older than my son. And, uh, and the fact that that is, that was a dangerous place for them and that there continues to be no political change that seems substantial for people who are living in many states in this country. We have to be mindful about that in our bubble um, where we live. To recognize the platform that we have. We do. And, and how much we can, we can advance that change and, um, and, and, and speak out. And normalize it. And that's where, as content creators, we have power. Because we need to create, I mean, we can now be married. Why? What happened? Well, you know, Modern Family happened, and Will and Grace happened, and, you know, gay people started to be in people's living rooms, like on CBS or, you know, not, not fringe media. So, so we need to really create, um, create uh, media where, where a kid like Nex is commonplace. And so I think that's a call to action for all of us is to really think about that um, and how we can participate in in helping normalize these lives. And 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 I do do want to acknowledge the part that the academy can play in that as well. Again, I want to highlight the affinity group, which is very important. I also want to highlight that, you know. Moments like Daniela Vega being the first transgender actress to present at the Oscars can change things. That uh, Rob Epstein being the first um, uh, uh, winner to acknowledge their partner on stage at the Oscars can change things. Um, and all of your nominations can lead to progress. So uh, congratulations to all of you on the nomination. Thank you for participating in our panel and thank you to all of you for for joining us tonight. Thank you very much.